Mass Effect is one of the most popular game series of all time. The team at BioWare developed realistic and organic characters, storylines that challenge the player's philosophical and moral principles, and all in one of the most atmospheric and engaging environments ever seen in any art form, including video games. So why is it so controversial? Yeah, I'm sure many of us were disappointed when they announced Freddy Prince Jr. and Seth Green were going to be working on a project together, and it wasn't the much desired sequel to Scooby-Doo 2, Scooby-Doo 3, The Case of Who Killed Matthew Lillard's Career. The real reason everyone seemed to turn on Mass Effect was its ending. More specifically, the Star Child. Well, I want to stick my neck out and defend Mass Effect's ending. And I know, the gaming community has pretty much already made up its mind on this issue, and I expect the hate comments. So just leave those right here. Or if YouTube changes their interface again... here? Maybe? I don't know. Refer here. But hey! I'll humbly accept my role among martyrs like Joan of Arc and Gandhi because I think this message is worth hearing. On this episode, we're talking about how Mass Effect is an allegorical retelling of Nietzsche's story of the death of God. I want to start by mentioning that the plot of the series is the largest in scope that I have ever experienced. Sure, tons of games have you save the world, but the entire galaxy? This is on a whole new level. The idea of an enemy destroying and harvesting organic life to maintain some sort of celestial cycle is not only creepy, it's also epic. In fact, it forced me, at least, to take a step back and consider what the Reapers actually are. They're a whole new degree of enemy. Ones who don't just claim that it's in their best interest for them to maintain the cycle, they suggest that it's only in the interest of the organics. They risk their own lives to maintain this weird cycle, and for what purpose? That combined with the fact that they're seemingly all-knowing and not to mention seemingly all-powerful, they certainly seem to claim We are eternal. This got me wondering, could it be that the Reapers are actually angelic soldiers that have come to enforce God's will? God's will in this case being an extinction of all advanced races of the galaxy, and as a commentary on what humanity is, Mass Effect is arguing that we will kill God and by doing so we will free ourselves of an obsolete worldview and adopt a more relevant one? Can this really be the case that's being made? And from a video game? Well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> What's that? Please, sir. I want some more. You want the long answer. Alright, just remember, you asked for it. Let's just say, for sake of argument, that everything in the book of Revelation from the Christian Bible is correct. Everything except accurately predicting God winning the battle for Earth. That's one hell of an ambitious premise, isn't it? I think I know what you're thinking. Why don't you put your mouth where your mouth is? Yeah, but probably not in those words, because you're not an idiot. Let's just start by looking at the prophecies foretold in Revelation. The first is the commonly known seven-headed beast. The Bible describes it as having seven different heads, all of which look physically distinct and wears a crown. Its sole purpose is to bring war with God in what is literally the final battle. The Bible describes this as being his function in Revelation 13:7, where it marvels, the beast was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given the authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. In addition to this, part of the description of the beast is one of the heads has sustained a mortal wound, but heals itself, thus striking awe into its followers. So where does this come into play? Well, in Mass Effect, the beast is represented by the alien races that unite to destroy the Reapers. Again, we need seven. We've got humans, Taurians, Asari, the Krogan, Salarians, Quarians, and the Geth. And that makes seven. Of course, I don't want to look like I'm being flippant about the fact that there are many more galactic races that are part of the Citadel. No question here. But in the third game, your mission is to visit the respective planets of the seven races that have the most substantial military might. Keep in mind that the Bible says that it was given the power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. That's why these seven matter. It is your mission to unite the armies of the galaxy together to fight the Reapers. Here's where things get really interesting. One of your objectives in the third game is to go to Tachanka and cure the Krogan of the Genophage. Remember how part of the description of the beast says that one of the heads heals itself of a mortal wound? I think that a fertility rate of 1 in 1000 is certainly one that could be considered a mortal wound. After all, if they continued the war that brought about the Genophage, they risked extinction. 
Of course, the player has the choice as to whether or not they actually do this, or just appear to do this. But whether you do or do not, the important thing is, there is an appearance that the beast has healed itself. So what about the second beast I briefly mentioned earlier? Well, there's one last distinction that needs to be made first. The first beast is the beast from the sea. The second beast is called the beast from the earth. I think we can all argue that there is one entity that is, in the most literal sense, from Earth. The pro-human at any cost group, Cerberus. Just to humor the metaphor, many gamers have met this beast before as it, in the setting of gaming lore, has been around the block. It comes from the mythology provided by Dante Alighieri's Inferno. The role of this beast in the mythology is to guard the gates of the underworld. The role of the biblical version of the beast, however, plays out a little bit differently. According to Revelation 13.15, his role is literally to give breath into the image of the first beast so that it could speak. This is where Commander Shepard comes in, because there's a common theme throughout your playthrough of the final game. The entire galaxy united. Too bad it took the Reapers to bring us together. Shepard united them. I know you didn't like me, Agent, but nobody could have accomplished what you've done. Uniting the Galactic Alliance is the role that Shepard plays in the final game. Without him, the beast would be scattered, and it would not have focused its power in the last stand against the Reapers. In this respect, he is the image of the first beast. But wait a minute, Soul Porpoise, I bet you're thinking. When did Cerberus breathe life into anything in the game? That is a pretty essential part of the prophecy. Cerberus actually does come through for us when they create the Lazarus Project to breathe life into Commander Shepard. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? Well, if that doesn't satisfy your prophecy appetite, here are some more for you, you glutton. The Bible predicts the Reaper attack on Earth. It reads, and I quote, The first angel sounded his trumpet, and although this noise is an obvious musical instrument, it's also the first time we've heard this terrifying trumpet blast. Then we have what's tantamount to plagiarizing God when Sovereign says, We have no beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. This sounds alarmingly similar to Revelation 22:13, where God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We also have this, If this ain't the end of days, it's pretty damn close. And that combined with Freddie Prince Jr. saying this makes a lot more sense. That's not to mention the biblical references we see all over. From the characters who inherit their names from the Bible, Eve? Female's real name unknown. Normandy, a human vessel. Human mythology seemed appropriate under circumstances. To the project that received the name Lazarus from the miracle, the entire game seems to make sure that you know it's aware that the New Testament exists. One of the most blatant examples that the Reapers are celestial soldiers of God comes into conversation with Legion when he's describing the relationship between the aptly named heretics and Sovereign. What did you call Sovereign? Nazara. That was what the programs within the Reaper called themselves. Sovereign was a title given by Saren Arterius. The actual reason that the developers went with the name Nazara has huge importance. Upon looking up the etymology in my trusty word book, Oh what? You call it a dictionary? Look, we get it. You went to college. The word Nazara comes from the Latin Nazareus, and Nazareus is linked to the biblical word Nazarite, which literally translates to one who is consecrated to the service of God. If you do accept that this is indeed a war with God, then do we ever actually meet the Abrahamic deity? Yeah, we did. I argue that the catalyst is God. Just before the meeting with the Star Child, Shepard's body physically seems to die. His body collapses and you see him ascend to the heavens encompassed in a white light. Shepard is now atop the Citadel, and although I don't have any personal experience with this, I've been told that there's no air in space to speak in, or you know, breathe. Now we are greeted by a boy dressed in white wool, transparent, glowing in an ethereal white light, and these symbols aren't unique to the Mass Effect universe. Wool clothing worn by a young boy is something that literature has often used to symbolize God. After all, it is generally argued that God must be innocent. And if God does represent innocence, then there is certainly innocence in the child that now haunts Shepard, whom he failed to protect on Earth. Lastly, if the Catalyst is God, his explanations now seem to make a lot more sense. The Reaper 
Fears are mine. I control them. They are my solution. You bring it on yourselves. The created will always rebel against their creators. This line right here. This is the most important line in the entire game because he is referring to humans rebelling against their creators, i.e. God. After all, God certainly is responsible for being our creator if we are to believe the Bible. And this brings me to the well-established theme of the relationship between the Geth and the Quarians. They certainly were one hell of a case study for the created rebelling against its creators. But as we see here, wait, the Geth spared the last Quarians? We let them go. We were in our infancy. We could not calculate the repercussions of destroying an entire species. They chose not to destroy their creators because they couldn't predict the implications of making such a choice. And here you are atop the catalyst, forced to contemplate the same decision. But we'll come back to this point. For now, let's take a look at what can be learned from the very central theme of the creation of the Geth. After all, we have a remarkably similar origin. This question leads to. Do you remember the question that caused the creators to attack us, Talizora? Does this unit have a soul? Notice how the question changed from these units to this unit. It's a semantic variation, but it's also a symbolic one. They were designed to work from consensus, and now they desire individuality. What caused the Geth to rebel was their desire to be like their creators and have a soul. Legion is a character who shows the most dramatic signs of this evolution. When you first meet Legion, Miranda says that he is only wearing Shepard's old armor because of a simple coincidence. She argues that wearing his armor as a trophy would imply an emotion that AIs lack. So maybe I'm conditioned to think this way, but whenever Miranda says something, I assume it's wrong. That can't be right. My calculations are correct. The Collector homeworld is located within the galactic core. It's just easier this way. So let's look at the conversation with Legion and try to get an idea for how wrong Miranda is yet again. When we took you aboard, I noticed you have a piece of N7 armor welded to you. Where did you get it? It was yours. That doesn't explain why you use my armor to fix yourself. There was a hole. But why didn't you fix it sooner? Or with something else? No data available. Legion wears this armor of the fallen galactic hero because it offers something that's highly symbolic. It makes him unique and allows him to separate himself from the massive group think that is the Geth. The soul Legion is after represents individuality, and having this soul is what's important to him. So important, it's the last thing on his mind before he dies. Talisora, does this unit have Yes. Yes, it does. What we can learn from this is that there's a natural desire for the created to become like their creators. In this case, it's to have a soul. So what's this got to do with us? Well, for that answer, we need to look to our origin story. And I know that many of you are not in this for a Sunday school lesson, so I'll try to make this as fast as possible. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and things were pretty swell. The rules were this. There were two trees from which man was forbidden to eat. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. Well, we all know the rest of the story. Man ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and from this he obtained what many argue is man's free will. As punishment, man was forbidden to re-enter the Garden of Eden, but God banishes man for another reason on top of this. In Genesis 3.20, God says, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so if it's to be understood that the only thing separating humanity from being equal to God is immortality, does this also mean that if God is made mortal, we will become godlike? For this I refer to Friedrich Nietzsche, the famous 19th century philosopher who has already taken a stab at this question in his story, The Gay Science. He writes, God is dead, 
God remains dead, and we have killed him. Yet his shadow still looms. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderer of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of it? And if making your final choice actually does kill God, well, where does that leave us? We never could be certain if God had a plan for us all, but I think it's safe to say that this has been taken off the table. And this is something that's made clear by the Reapers when they let us know how they view themselves. We represent order. We impose order. And how they view humanity. You represent chaos. 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 And this brings us to the fact that one of the implied consequences of God dying is pure nihilism. The philosophy that not only do things happen for no real reason, but there's no such thing as objective morality, and there's no meaning of life. Ultimately, this is what the Reapers argue will happen. Without them, all organic life will destroy itself by creating synthetics. Simply put, there will be chaos. The problem here is that you don't really have a way of knowing this to be true. You just have to kind of take the Reaper's word for it. Plus, Mass Effect seems to have a pretty optimistic view of our diplomatic relations. Legion, that's back when I activated you on the Normandy. Yes. You've been thinking about when we met? It was highly significant. You were the first organic to openly cooperate with Geth since the end of the Morning War. We wish to ensure you are not the last. And that's not just synthetics of Corian design. We also have a cooperative synthetic in the somehow sexy and sometimes witty Edie. Ah, uh, you want me to go crawling through the ducts again? I enjoy the sight of humans on their knees. Hey, it's okay if you don't have a droll reply to give her back, Joker. We'll get you set up with the writers of the Big Bang Theory. There's no one better at making robots laugh. Bazinga. That wasn't funny. So this is where the comparison between the Geth and the humans really splits off. Remember how the Geth decided not to destroy their creators because they could not predict the implications of that action? Let us now come back to the point that I put off and look at our final decision. You now have the choice, either to put off the decision, merge synthetic and organic life, or destroy the Reapers. Now Nietzsche doesn't conform to one school of thought. But I think one of his most important ideas, and the one that we've already touched on, is his belief in individualism. He comes up with the term Ubermensch, and although it sounds just like another funny German word like schnitzel or hamburger? Ham hamburger? Ubermensch essentially means that it's the responsibility and the privilege of the individual to determine the meaning of their existence for themselves. Other existentialists get in on this idea as well. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre argues that one's individuality is defined by the choices that they make, and hopefully, there's a reason for why they make these decisions. And that's what's so extraordinary about the fact that our story is told through this medium. Mass Effect allows you to make your own choices about how you interact with this universe, not as a gimmick, but as a didactic mechanism. That is to say, a way to teach us about the reality in which we actually participate. And given Sartre's definition of individualism, the player is making this final decision based on how they view the world and what morals and philosophies they think are worth considering. And ultimately, their decision is justified. So as much as people argue that the endings are essentially the same, there is something that you added to them that makes them completely unique to you. Your unique reasoning that informed your choices. This is why the video game has become one of the most compelling and moving pieces of art that I have ever encountered. What matters here is not the decision that you make, it's that your decision is informed by your philosophies, your worldview, your individualism. And given that your choices are an indicator of who you are, there's one final theme that we need to look at, the impact of your decisions. After all, your decisions can cause you to lose the opportunity to handle things diplomatically for punching journalists. Who knew, right? You can even save an entire species to try to give them a second chance. One of the most important examples of this is when you help find Morton's assistant, Malin. When you find out that he has been trying to cure the genophage with unethical means, Morton confronts him. And we find out from Malin that he thinks that making these decisions that ultimately have huge consequences are parallel to godliness. Supposition. Impossible to be certain. Don't you see? We tried to play God and we failed. We only made things worse, and I'm going to fix it! So now I want to quickly digress and talk about how this theme really hit home for me. 
In the third game, we of course find that Morden has changed his mind on the Genophage. Again, many of the decisions that you've made so far have impacted this event on Tachanka. If you have done everything as diplomatically as possible, like saving Rex on Vermeer and keeping the cure research that Malin worked on, then ethically speaking, this should be a walk in the park for you. But if you tried playing the third game without importing your character data like I did one playthrough, you're in completely different territory. In this situation, Erdnot Reeve makes a great case for why you should sabotage the Genophage cure. After today, Krogan's superiority obvious to everyone. Rare opportunity to improve galactic opinion of Krogan. Hope you use it wisely. Our people were made for war. It's what they want. And you need to be the leader who tells them they're wrong. And would our ancestors forgive their enemies so easily? It's the threat that matters. Do our enemies fear even the idea of retribution? We have the power. What would you do with that power, Reeve? <laughs> that would be telling. It left me in a very undesirable situation because I knew Morden, and I knew how he now desired to cure the Genophage. The problem with this is that a probable outcome of a cure would be another galactic war brought about by the Krogan-led Erdnot Reeve. And now I had no other option. I had to stop Morden from making the decision that would ultimately undo all of my work. And so now... I was left with a dreadful ultimatum. I had to choose if I would commit the ultimate betrayal of my perfect pitched friend, or permit him to do what I believed was not only unethical, but dangerous. Ultimately, I convinced myself that I was left with no choice, and in one of the most memorable and dramatic scenes I've ever witnessed, I watched Morden die. But I can't say his death was in vain because, and I say this with absolute sincerity, I remember justifying my actions with his quote had to be me. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. And given the context of this game, and looking to yourself to give meaning to the world, and that meaning informing your choices, the effects of your choices can be profound. And this is something that I think the epilogue sums up perfectly. When can I go to the stars? One day, my sweet. What will be there? Anything you can imagine. Our galaxy has billions of stars. Each of those stars could have many worlds. Every world could be home to a different form of life. And every life is a special story of its own. Tell me another story about the shepherd. It's getting late, but okay, one more story. So now the player is left considering their own special story, and how their choices are their stamp with which to leave an impact on the world, and maybe even one day, the galaxy. This is an idea that truly deserves to be considered a Mass Effect.